I believe we are living in the future. Moore may have passed, but Moore's law lives on. Despite what the naysayers would have you believe, such as these guys, transistor scaling is still here, and there are roadmaps for transistor scaling for another decade or even more. You should check out the video we've done on it. This means with each new generation, we have more transistors to use. On top of that, new advanced packaging means we're making processors physically bigger than ever before as well. But what do we do with all this transistor budget? Well, in this video, we're going to look deeper into what flashy new features that more transistors have enabled in Xeon processors. These are the sort of features that will drive the future experience of everyone's computer, just like the segue to our sponsor. A lot of the content on this channel wouldn't be possible without you, the supporters. Many thanks to all who support. And if you're interested in supporting, then we have Patreon, we have a merch store, I have a Substack newsletter, or simply just like and subscribe. It really does help out the channel. When a chip designer has access to more transistors, that means they can do more stuff. They can make the core a bit smarter, or increase the cache sizes, or make the chip network more intelligent. These are usually what happens first, power permitting, and you can even get more cores as well. But what if there's another way? We are now in a computing era where there are dedicated, well-defined workloads. When a workload is well-defined, with the same instructions over and over again, you can design circuits to do that workload really, really fast and at lower power. We already experience this in our daily lives. Your graphics card, whether it's integrated or discrete, contains video encoders and decoders that will take a format of video, such as H.264 or AV1, and decode it for you to watch or encode it for you to stream. A modern smartphone contains digital signal processors to help with the camera and imaging. So instead of all this work happening on the CPU, it gets its own dedicated area of silicon, and we call that an accelerator. Those are examples of consumer workloads. However, how many of us are aware of what workloads this applies to in the data center? This is where I bring out this bad boy, Intel's fourth generation Xeon scalable processor, codenamed Sapphire Rapids. This chip launched in early 2023, and the big models contain over 1600 square millimeters of silicon and tens of billions of transistors. And this is a chip that a lot of Intel customers will upgrade to. Intel isn't the only one, but in order to support their workload, they've invested some of its transistor budget into new classes of accelerators, specifically for the enterprise market, and hopefully reduce cost of the services we use every day. Now, Intel has four new accelerators hardened into the silicon, and with the right CPU model, customer can have four of these accelerators, each CPU. The first accelerator you might recognize is QAT, or Quick Assess Technology. This has been around for a few years now, and Intel tried to sell it as part of the chipset or a PCI card, much like a GPU. But now it comes built into the chip, like a consumer GPU does. Quick Assist Technology does what your network card should already do, inline network cryptographic decoding and encoding. Normally, this can take up to four cores per CPU on a 200 gigabit connection but now it can be something you offload onto its own dedicated area on your CPU. In public testing with NGINX, using an encrypted web server system on OpenSSL, the QAT accelerator was measured on a system where the minimum customer requirements involved processing an encrypted connection at an average of 15 microseconds on a 120 core system. On Intel, the load on the CPU reduced from 70 cores without using QAT to 11 cores with this new accelerator. This is important because of content delivery networks. When you stream a video, it isn't one single stream. It's downloading lots of little chunks of video and stitching them together. Each one has to be securely validated, and this helps reduce the cost of system deployment. Now, what if you're doing something in-house? You have big databases and your network traffic is encrypted, but you also want those data in the databases encrypted and compressed, perhaps somewhere like Facebook or any social media. Then you might want Intel's in-memory analytics accelerator which enables offloading the compression decompression of database elements, which whenever you post on social media is something that happens millions of times a second. Using RocksDB with IAA integration, Intel has demonstrated almost 2x the performance with half the latency versus competition. That's based on a ZSTD level compression. The point here is that you can double reads and writes to a database and each one takes only half the time, saving power and ultimately saving money. Now, lots of enterprises have terabytes of memory per server, backed up with either petabytes of storage, either flash, or good old spinning rust. One of the new features in enterprise storage we're familiar with is NVMe. 
which is essentially putting an SSD across a PCI interface. Companies are now plugging that flash storage directly into the network in a technology called NVMe over fabric. NVMe over fabric is different to traditional NVMe because instead of a storage protocol on PCIe, you now have a storage protocol over the Ethernet. This means not only crypto support, but also compression and Ethernet error connection as well. This is what DSA, or Intel's new Data Streaming Accelerator, is all about. Doing that work, but offloading it from the CPU cores on its own dedicated silicon. With DSA, Intel can accelerate the number of data requests to over 200 gigabit per second network connection, reducing the latency of sequential and random reads, supporting 2x the throughput. Now, in every enterprise deployment, where you have thousands of queries flying in and out of the network, solutions are sold to meet the minimum service level requirements, or what we call SLAs. This means that, for example, a customer wants a service with a 10 millisecond response time as the worst case scenario, and a system has to be built to provide that. This is what we also call the quality of service. Because most response times to a server, to a database are variable, a curve or bell can be plotted, showing how long each response is taken, where the SLA is, and what the system can actually do. In an out-of-the-box setup, you're relying on the network to handle everything and hoping that one specific CPU core doesn't get too overloaded with requests. Some software packages have queue managers built in to balance the workload, but it still relies on some extra CPU work. This is why Intel developed the Dynamic Load Balancer, and it can now do that in hardware. Using DPDK, the Dynamic Load Balancer can offload the queue management from the CPU cores, ensuring equal distribution of tasks and bandwidth, batching memory accesses for power-aware and I.O.-aware metrics, and priority queuing if you need a fast lane or have multiple different requirements to meet. Intel's documentation here says that in a maximum configuration, 400 million load balancing decisions can be made every second. Now, I've just listed the four main new accelerators, the fixed function hardware for specific enterprise workflow. But there's also a fifth that I think is worth mentioning here. I think by now, at least if you've followed me for a while, I've covered vector extensions like AVX512 or modern processors before. We've seen it on AMD now, but Intel is still invested in a strong AVX ecosystem on the Xeons. As a result, we now have next generation AVX, except this time Intel is calling it AMX for advanced matrix extensions. It works best with matrix math, and guess what machine learning is full of? Now, AMX is built into the heart for machine learning. Rather than just have up to four of these per chip like the other accelerators mentioned, Intel has an AMX unit in every single core, and it's called like a regular instruction path. AMX supports machine learning data types like 8-bit integers or 16-bit brain floats, which are great for inference because Intel states that it has a 4x performance lead over the competition in CPU-based inference. They're even beating themselves over previous AI instructions like VNNI to the tune of 2x. Now you might be surprised to hear about CPUs being used for machine learning. You know, GPUs are being used everywhere else. Though according to some metrics, especially for machine learning inference, CPUs are still the major player because they've been adaptable to new models and use cases better than other hardware. Intel has already worked closely with companies like Alibaba Cloud to implement AMX, especially because Alibaba has a diverse, what we call inference workload on recommendation engines. Alibaba sells a lot, retail, finance, logistics, and AMX is very well suited for those workloads. AMX is also being looked at for reduced precision in high performance computing, which is still a very nascent and new field of research. So if you want to use or test one of these accelerators, then you have to be able to read Intel's CPU list, which is difficult. There are over 50, but it's actually really simple. If you want AMX, then you can get any of these processors because it's in every single core. For the other accelerators, some CPUs come with zero, one, or up to four of them. You have to look specifically at the CPU model with a plus in the name, such as the Xeon Silver 4416 Plus, or the Xeon Gold 5420 Plus, or the 6438Y Plus. That plus at the end means it has at least one of every accelerator. If you specifically want the Dynamic Streaming Accelerator, then that's actually pretty simple because there's a guaranteed one in every CPU. What all of this is foreshadowing is how many transistors we will be able to use per chip in the future. The rise of chiplets is helping increase just how much silicon we have and process node improvements increases that transistor density. Those transistors will have to be sent, spent somewhere. Companies have said that with these new technologies, the chip is now more like the motherboard, with chiplets doing different things and optimized for each process. Intel has stated that they will have a trillion transistor chip 
in the market by 2030, which is an almost 10x increase from today. With that many tiny switches available, we are moving ever closer to an ecosystem where instead of cores or cache, we might have most of the silicon become accelerators. If you like this video, don't forget to like and subscribe. When it comes to Intel Xeon, I'm still really interested in getting my hands on Intel CPU Max with onboard high bandwidth memory. I mean, 64 gigabytes of CPU and optional DRAM? Just give me one in a workstation and I'll be happy. We'll get that in another video, perhaps.